Hypnosis. Is it real or is it fake? Have you ever watched someone be hypnotized either on stage or on the street and wondered if they're just highly paid actors or actresses? I'm Dr. Justin Chandler, a neurovascular neurohospitalist, a brain specialist, and today we're going to settle the debate. Throughout this entire video, we will not hypnotize you nor use any tactics of hypnosis. So let's get started. So let's ask the questions and get to the answers. Number one, is it real? Yes, it is. Number two, can everyone or anyone be hypnotized? No. Number three, is it mind magic? Well, sort of. And if the answer is sort of, how does it work? By the end of this video, you will know exactly what happens. Number five, is it dangerous? It sure can be. Number six, is it helpful? It sure can be. So let's get into it. Let's try to set the stage for a neurological framework to help us understand hypnosis. In doing so, let's tease out the difference between two things, the brain and the mind. I want you to think of the brain as the structure of the brain, the cells that are in the brain, the networks, that connect every part of the brain together and work in unity. The communication that happens between those cells, between those neurons and between those networks, including the neurotransmitters and the hormones, in the blood vessels and oxygen that are involved. The brain is all of these things. But the brain also includes the mind. And understanding how this is different is going to really help us understand how hypnosis works. Because when we think of the mind, we want to think about our thoughts, our emotions, our reactions, our dreams that we have, and our impressions. And when we have the brain coupled with the mind and welded to the body, we can then understand the concept of our wills. As a neurologist, I can see your brain. I can see the structure of your brain on a head CT scan or on an MRI scan. I can also do an autopsy after someone passes away and see their brain. In neurosurgery, we can take a portion of the skull off, remove the lining or the covering of the brain, the meninges, and we can see the actual brain itself. In fact, I can put electrodes on someone's scalp to monitor their brain waves and see the electrical activity of their brain. We can go even further. We now put electrodes on and in the brain itself. We even do things called deep brain stimulation where we put small devices within the brain to help treat and control illnesses like movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. Perhaps the best technique and the best technology I have as a neurologist to see the brain is the neurological exam. Think of a stroke. If someone comes in and a portion of their brain doesn't have the blood flow it needs, I can see their face droop. I can watch or witness their arm get weak. I can hear a change in their speech. So as a neurologist, as a brain doctor, we can see the brain very well. But what I can't see are your thoughts. I can't look at you, and if you were to keep your face emotionless, actually understand and interpret your emotions. I can't see or hear your secrets. That is the mind. And these things are the brain. Hypnosis includes both the brain and the mind and the neural networks that come together to help make us who we are. 
Let's talk about the specific structures and the function of those structures that are used during hypnosis. Hypnosis is a technique, some call it a neuropsychological art, that bridges these two things, the brain and the mind. And the two major areas that are used and emphasized in hypnosis are the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, as well as the medial prefrontal and posterior cingulate cortex. These two regions of the brain typically work in tandem. They work together to help you perform and function perfectly how you want to. In fact, think about it this way. You've now been listening to a discussion about hypnosis for several minutes. But I do have a question for you. Are you wearing your underwear? What about your socks? Do you have on a watch? Well, you may say, yes, of course I do. And my question for you would be, well, is that because you were sitting there thinking about your underwear the whole time we've been talking about hypnosis? Were you thinking that your watch was on the whole time? No. But if you take a second and you move a little or wiggle your toes, you verify that your socks and your underwear and your watch are in place. That's because the Pacinian corpuscles on your skin are constantly, constantly sending a signal all the way up to your brain to let you know that your underwear's on, that your socks are on, that your watch is on, your glasses may be in place as you watch this. And as that signal comes up through the insula, through the thalamus and other regions of the brain, it then gets registered in the cortex. The brain says, yeah, I've got it. And it sends another signal down saying, I don't care anymore. And because the I don't care signal gets sent back down, that signal then gets blocked. This is a key concept for you to understand in hypnosis. When that signal then gets blocked, even though it's still being sent, our mind and our brain doesn't register or think about it anymore at all. Until the question's brought back up, are you wearing your underwear? Or until another cue is given, or until something else is suggested to you that allows the signal or the thought to then come back up to the cortex of the brain, the portions of the brain that help you understand and process that information that's being suggested to you. So let's talk about the anatomy of hypnosis. I want you to finish this video and know exactly what's going on. And I want you to be able to tell your parents and your friends and your children exactly what happens in hypnosis. The dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is the portion of your brain that controls your focus and your concentration. Have you ever been driving in your car and the music is playing and you are so into the song that you're not paying much attention to the people on the other side of the road, the people passing you in, the, in their other cars, and then you suddenly miss your exit. And you go, oh, what was I thinking? That's him. That's the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. It's what gets you so in the conversation that you then end up missing your stop on the subway. In hypnosis, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is cranked up into overdrive. Another great example, if you went to wash your hands, you turn the hot water on and the cold water on, you get the temperature just right. That's everyday function, the perfect temperature to wash your hands. But when you increase what is going on in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, that's like shutting off the cold water and cranking up the hot. It's super focused. It allows you to zone in to exactly what you are doing and forget and not recognize anything else that's going on around you. So if that's what the DACC does, let's talk about what the medial prefrontal and the posterior cingulate cortex do. When someone is in a hypnotized state, these portions of the brain are decreased. And a decreased posterior cingulate cortex activity allows you to dissociate your actions from what you are functionally 100% focused on. Let me give you an example. If I step on a nail, I have a reflex 
that automatically occurs. The pain response and signal goes up from my foot into my spinal cord and right back down to my foot and I jerk my foot up quick. It never goes to my brain. If that reflex went all the way up to my brain and I had to think about it and look down and see the nail sticking up through my foot and then take my foot off of it, it would lead to a lot of damage. Hypnosis is like ingraining a reflex arc in your brain. I increase the focus of what my thought is, and then I take away the thoughts associated with the action, like the pulling your foot off of a nail. That allows someone in a hypnotized state to be able to focus specifically on one thought or a suggestion that they have been given and disassociate themselves from whatever action may come along with it or whatever action was suggested to the individual being hypnotized. Now let's talk about what a suggestion is. This is very critical to understanding hypnosis. Suggestions can start with the surroundings or the environment that a person walks into. A suggestion can be a simple touch, a physical cue that's given to the brain. In fact, in your own brain, before you do or say anything, your thoughts are formed way in advance before they then get processed and translated out to the rest of the world. And you can put suggestions and thoughts in those areas of your brain before they ever even emerge into your actions. Suggestions happen all the time. That's what marketing is, isn't it? Let me give you a better example of a suggestion, one that has happened to you in your life a hundred times. Maybe you've had this conversation with your spouse. Maybe it's with your girlfriend, your boyfriend. Maybe it's with your children, your grandma or your grandpa. What are we going to do for dinner? Well, if your kid says, I'd like pizza, there's a suggestion. But what typically happens in your mind is you think, how much money do I have for pizza? How long will it take to go get the pizza? Should I order the pizza? Should I have the pizza delivered? Should I go pick up the pizza? How much pizza should I order? What kind of pizza do I want? What toppings do I want on the pizza? You see, your brain has all of these decisions and choices that it thinks about when a suggestion is given to you. But in hypnotism, and when someone's hypnotized, you implant a suggestion or you recommend a suggestion. And that suggestion becomes the thing that you focus 100% on. And then you take away all of the questions associated with the suggestion and encourage the action to be performed. Should we get pizza? Oh yeah, I already delivered it. That's what hypnosis is. So let's summarize hypnosis. It's simple. In hypnosis, the DACC gets ramped up 100%. That's the part of the brain that allows you to zone in and focus on one specific thing or task or suggestion. And at the same time that the DACC is ramped up 100%, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex are shut all the way down. And that allows you not to think about anything else. It allows you to take your actions and separate them from the thought that you're focused on. It allows you to put away all of the social cueing or the situation or even the environment in the typical standard social rules that are involved with it. That's hypnosis. So what can start as a simple suggestion can then flower and blossom into an idea that is so incredibly powerful that your mind will shut everything else out. In fact, the research that was done by my colleagues at Cornell University and at Stanford University hypnotized individuals and put them in a functional MRI machine. In one of these, they suggested to the participants that it was impossible for them to move their arm and their hand. And in the MRI machines, you can see the increased signal in the DACC and the decreased signals that happen in the posterior cingulate cortex. And watch the faces of individuals try as hard as they possibly can to lift and impossible to move on. Ideas can become the most powerful things in the world.
Hypnosis can be so powerful that people end up doing things that they would never normally do. You'll get up on the stage and scream like a little girl, even if you're a big 250 pound muscle man. You'll get up there and quack like a duck. You'll cry your eyeballs out. That's where the entertainment lies in stage and street hypnosis. I guess maybe one of the best ways you can think about it is like a sunrise. There's a whole arc when it comes to hypnotism. And whether that's a mild suggestion that's made in a marketing advertisement as the sun just starts to rise, whether it's the hunger pains that you're feeling or the dry mouth that you're getting and you see a Sprite commercial or water that you're thinking about or the pizza that your kids suggest, all the way up to when the sun is blazing hot at high noon and you have been completely hypnotized by a master and an expert in suggestibility and hypnosis. Someone who knows how to ramp up your DACC and decrease everything else that happens in your posterior cingulate cortex. That spectrum of hypnosis affects all of us. It's a part of our environment. We live with it every day. So now that you know so much about hypnosis, now that you understand the neural pathways, the neural networks, the suggestibility that is part of it, we could have provided hypnotic cueing and suggestions during this video, but we didn't. And why? Well, because of moral ethics and moral accountability. You see, I'm sure that you have felt uncomfortable when you've watched somebody be hypnotized on the street or up on stage. And perhaps the reason you felt that way is because of this sense of control. Our autonomy, our ability to control our own actions and the choices that we make is inherent to exactly who you are. And giving that power over to another individual for entertainment purposes, maybe that's why you felt that way. But you don't have to feel that way about all hypnosis. Imagine if you were struggling and fighting to stop smoking. You've used patches. You've gone to psychobehavioral therapy. Hypnosis can be a great value to you. In fact, hypnosis is now also offered as an alternative way to help you get through medical biopsy procedures. So perhaps the best way to think about hypnosis is to think about hypnosis occurring in a state with an individual or a physician that you trust, with specific boundaries that have been put in place, and a specific goal in mind to accomplish or to achieve at the end of the hypnosis. I really hope that you've enjoyed learning about hypnosis today and learning about the brain and the mind and the will and how they work together. Hypnosis isn't magic. It's not a secret. It's something we can understand and harness the power of our brain to use in ways that are beneficial.